from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon, Justice Thomas, who is in the room downstairs, distinguished guests and colleagues. Thank you for joining the Law Library of Congress and the United States Supreme Court today for the 2018 Supreme Court Fellows Program Annual Lecture. My name is Jane Sanchez, and I have the honor of serving as the 25th Law Librarian of Congress. A little bit about the library. The Law Library serves as the nation's custodian of a legal and legislative collection of nearly three million items from all countries and legal systems of the world. Our foreign law specialists are a diverse group of foreign trained attorneys who provide information and analysis on over 270 jurisdictions in the world. Our skilled law, excuse me, our skilled law library staff, both American trained attorneys and law librarians, also provide research assistance and reference services on US federal and state legal issues. While our collections and our expertise reach across all points of the globe, for today's event, we've partnered with our next door neighbor, who happens to be the highest court in the country. By the way, they are pretty good neighbors. They're quiet, and they keep to themselves pretty much. <laughs> this afternoon, we are pleased to be able to collaborate with the Supreme Court as they celebrate their 45th year of the Fellows Program. Please note that today's program is being live streamed on the Library of Congress YouTube channel, so all sounds, images, and remarks will be captured on video. Please take a moment to silence your cell phones and refrain from taking photos on any devices throughout the event. For that, we would thank you. At this time, I would like to invite to the stage Jeffrey P. Muneer, Executive Director of the Supreme Court Fellows Program and Counselor to the Chief Justice of the United States. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jane, for the warm introduction. And thanks to you and the Law Library of Congress for your partnership with the Supreme Court Fellows Program in sponsoring this afternoon's event. Since its creation in 1832, when the great John Marshall was still serving as Chief Justice, the Law Library has been an important resource and steady friend of the court. We could not ask for a better neighbor than the largest law library in the world. And they're pretty quiet, too. <laughs> Let me say just a word about the Supreme Court Fellows Program in my capacity as its executive director. Each year, the Supreme Court Fellows Commission, made up of judges and other legal leaders appointed by the Chief Justice, selects four talented professionals to spend a year within the federal judiciary participating in court administration while engaging in research and other enrichment opportunities. This afternoon's event is the public component of two days of activities in which we celebrate our current Supreme Court fellows and bring together 45 years of fellows program alumni. Over the course of today and tomorrow, we'll select next year's fellows from the superb finalists who are with us this afternoon. I understand we have many law students with us in the audience today, as well as law clerks from several courts in the federal and state systems. If you have an interest in how federal courts work, I hope you will take the time to learn more about the fellowship program and consider applying in a future year. I invite you to visit our website at fellows.supremecourt.gov. Applications for the 2019-2020 class will be due in November. But before you set to work on your applications, we have a great feature this afternoon. We have as our distinguished guest, the 105th Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States, the Honorable Clarence Thomas, who has served on the court since 1991. 10 years ago, Justice Thomas published his best-selling autobiography, My Grandfather's Son, 
That book shared, in the Justice's own words, his remarkable American story. I commend it to anyone seeking a compelling read. We have the book available for purchase both here and at the Supreme Court gift shop. We are fortunate to have with us also the Honorable Greg, Gregory Maggs to moderate today's conversation. When we planned this program, Greg was a professor at George Washington University Law School, but in the past month has received his judicial commission as a judge of the United States Court of Appeals for the Armed Forces. Judge Maggs was a law clerk to Justice Thomas in 1991, and before that to Justice Anthony Kennedy. Please join me in welcoming Justice Thomas and Judge Maggs. Thank you. Do you feel comfortable, Justice? No. <laughs> <laughs> this is not the, the, the most suitable position for introverts. You can ask it. We like to be in the shadows someplace. We were having a great time back, backstage. Oh, yeah, it was, worth, <laughs> it was just fine back there. <laughs> Don't you all have anything to do? <laughs> oh, my goodness. Sorry, you all are dragging yourselves out on this day. Justice, uh, Mr. Manier mentioned that it is the uh, 10th anniversary of your publication of your book, uh, is it? My Grandfather's Son. I have forgotten about that. And I thought, uh, I thought I'd start by just asking you a few questions about the book. Um, so you're Judge Mags now, huh? As about a week, about a week. That's right. Um, I think that's great. <laughs> I'm just changing the subject. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Justice Sam, um, you start out the book when you're nine years old. Why is that the place to start your autobiography? You know, I had the manuscript to that, and um, Terry Teachout, who was my final editor, was just a phenomenal human being and editor and musician, and he understood. Um, he dug deep into the manuscript, and he said, you know you have a great title. Uh, I had picked out the title to my grandfather's son. And he said, but you have to explain the title within the first page or two. And he said, I found the explanation buried in your manuscript. And the line is, I was nine years old when I met my father. And he said that most people don't, wouldn't think of that because ultimately my grandfather is my father. So I'm, I'm my grandfather's son, not my father's son. So that was my first encounter that I remember with my father. And so that's why I started it out there, to, to explain why um, I was my grandfather's son. Life didn't start out too easy. Um, you mentioned in the book that you grew up in Pinpoint, and then when you're in a home which didn't have water, it didn't have uh, electricity. Mm. When the house burned down, you moved to Savannah, and conditions got worse. I think you write that in the winter of 1995, you remember being hungry. 1954. 1955. 1955. Yeah, yeah boy. I was doing fine in 1995. Yeah. <laughs> 1955, you... Uh, you were hungry without knowing when you would eat and cold without knowing when you would be warm. That's a horrible feeling. But you know, I, the, today we kind of, I just get worn down. I was with a young woman who happened to be black in um, Kansas recently, and she said something really interesting. She said, I'm really tired of having to play the role of being black. I just want to go to school. And I think we, there's a, at some point, we're going to be fatigued with everybody being a victim. When I was a kid, there were tons of people who were in really bad circumstances. My grandfather <clears throat> would not, not let us wallow in that. And it, as you could tell throughout this book, he's my hero. He is the single greatest human being I've ever met. Uh, with nine months of education, but he never saw himself as a victim. He used to say, 
that he was a motherless child. He never knew his father. Um, <clears throat> his mother died when he was seven or eight years old. Of course, they didn't have birth certificates then, so he never knew quite how old he was. And then he was raised by his grandmother, who was a freed slave. Then she dies. <laughs> And then he lives with an uncle who has 12 or 13 kids and who was a hard man. And yet he never complained. And he always said, he would have this saying when you'd want to whine or something. He said, you know, you have to play the hand you're dealt. He'd always said, in those days, blacks played bid whist a lot. And he'd say, you always have to play the hand you're dealt. If you're dealt a bad hand, you still have to play it. And when we would whine about things, if you look at the bust in my office that my wonderful wife had made for me when I went on the court, um, the, his favorite quote was, old man can't is dead, I helped bury him. That is what I grew up with. That was in, I don't know if you saw the movie, The Help. That's my family, we were the help. My mother made $10 a week, $5 more if you had car fare. Um, Miss Mariah was a maid. Uh, my mother was a maid, my grandmother had been a maid, Miss Beck was a maid, uh, Cousin B was a maid, cause, Cousin uh, Dosha was a maid, Cousin, you see what I'm saying? Everybody, all of them were maids, and they were the help, and yet they never, ever complained. And life was hard. I mean, the things that we consider hard today, I had some college students ask me a few years back, how would I explain, you know, talk to them, now that the economy had taken a downturn. And I said, the, and I'm looking at them, and I said, how many of you don't have cell phones? Of course, they all had cell phones. How many of you don't have a computer? They all had computers. How many of you don't have a car? I think all but one had a car. I said, you're so far above the poverty line. And when I was in school, you were at the poverty line. You're making like 90 cents an hour. You had no money, you had no shoes or any, you had like boots and things like that. And you didn't worry about it because virtually everybody was there. And so when the economy took a downturn, when you're on the floor, isn't a whole lot further you can go. And the, for, for them, they're losing from up here to maybe midway down. So I, I really had no connection with them. But my further point, <laughs> I, my, I didn't have a radio, I didn't have a telephone, and they're complaining, and I certainly didn't have a car, but I, it wasn't a problem, because you had your dreams, you had your energy, you had more than the people you grew up around. I grew up around a world of total illiteracy. That's the beauty, I'm in the Library of Congress. Total illiteracy, but the thing that they had was this hope that the next generation would learn how to read. They knew how important it was for me. So my grandfather wouldn't let me take, I was a really good athlete too. I don't like to say that because then people want you to kind of show that you were a great athlete. And it's kind of a, too late in the day now. <laughs> but the, he would not give us time off to play sports. We worked on the oil truck or on the farm. But if it had to do with the library, you could do it. So at night, he would let me go to the Carnegie Library, where I'd started going in the summer of 1955 for the noble reason that summer 55, I was seven years old, and we had just moved into this little tenement on the east side. And on Saturday, they gave you cookies and juice. <laughs> so I went for the very high-minded reason of getting cookie and juice. And when you live in these neighborhoods, cookies and juice are a real treat. Along the way, they introduce you to Dr. Seuss. And if I hear, see spot run one more time. <laughs> the, but it was over, it was wonderful. And you got cookies and juice. But it gave me this image of the library as this place to learn. And it became a haven. So I walk in here, I said, look where I am. I come from this world of illiteracy, a place where they treasure learning, and I get to be in a place of learning with all the books and all the people who are literate. So um, the, that's a long way of saying I was very fortunate to grow up around people 
who saw beyond their circumstances and who refused to be limited by those circumstances or to wallow in the sort of victim status of their circumstances. Tell me more about your grandfather. He was a very strict man. Was he unfair? Oh, God, no. No, no. As people say, they ask sometimes about the nuns and my grandfather. Did you, you know, because in those days you had corporal punishment. And they said, well, did you get, like, beatings? I said, yeah, but not as many as I deserved. And, <laughs> and my grandfather, whenever he gave you one that he found out was unfair, that you didn't deserve it at that time, he said, well, that's for when, what you got away with. <laughs> and then you couldn't, what do you say? Because you knew you got away with stuff. And every one of us knew, oh, boy, I'm glad you didn't get me on that one. But the, no, my grandfather was a hard man, but not a harsh man. Life was hard. I mean, anybody in this room who grew up in that environment, that is a hard life where you have to figure out how you're going to put a meal on the table, uh, where you are, there's a very fine line between the, you not being able to eat today and being able to eat. And the gratitude, uh, we always said grace before and after meal, we're Catholic. And he would always be grateful and this was almost, this is the old porcelain top table. My grandfather sat here. I always sat facing him. I don't know why I got that position where he would just stare at you. Oh my God, help me. So, and then my grandmother sat here and my brother sat there in this small table. And he would always say, we are grateful that we have food on our table, clothes on our back, and a roof over our head. And it doesn't get much better than that. So the, he was never unfair. He was very generous. What he would do is, let's say, he would make us work to produce something. Then he would say, we are able to provide for others because we work. So we're able to give them corn or beans or peas or uh, syrup or sugar canes or uh, fruit because we work. We are able to give them meat because we raise the hogs. So what he taught us was we had an obligation to do well so that we could do good, particularly for others. So I could not call that fair. I think my grandfather was probably one of the most compassionate people I've ever known because he always told us the truth. He always told us the truth about life. And he would, so I asked my brother, my brother, unfortunately uh, died 18 years ago jogging. He was a year and four months younger and he and I grew up with my grandparents. And I asked him when we were in our 40s, uh, we were very close, and I said, um, do you think my, grandf my grandfather, when we went to live with him in 55 said, I will never tell you to do as I say. I will always tell you to do as I do. Watch me. And so I asked my brother years later, after my grandfather was long gone, was he ever a hypocrite? And my brother said, absolutely not. That he lived up to that, that think about that. Would you set yourself up as the model and the example to your own children? And all you do is you said, do as I do. Watch me every day. And once, and we watched it, because he would never let us out of his sight. <laughs> and when he did let you out of his sight, it was with the nuns. Um, or I could get away from him to the library. I loved the library. You know, the, we take it for granted now because we have all these computers and all that stuff. But just think of yourself coming from a house with no books, and you get to walk into this world and had Encyclopedia Americana, Encyclopedia Britannica. It had Webster. It had Funk and Wagnall. It had the, uh, all sorts of fiction. You know, it had um, magazines, Look, Life, Time, all the newspapers. It was like the smorgasbord every time you walked in. And the, the, you had the reference librarians who would introduce you to new things. 
Then they introduce you to National Geographic, so you were all over the world. And this is all in Savannah, Georgia. And remember, this is a world of segregation. So it gave you this window to everything else. It gave you a window beyond Georgia. And the nuns encouraged it, the librarians encouraged it. So I had an opportunity some years ago to go back and to write and thank all the librarians. And most recently, I ran into a lady in Savannah, an elderly white lady, because I was among the early kids who went to the Savannah Public Libraries to desegregate it. And I was kind of a nuisance there, too, because I kept showing up. I mean, it was like I was, where's Waldo? Where's Clarence? He's got to be here someplace. And, and it, I remember, it's a way, of, it's a time to get away from my grandfather. And it was just this amazing world. And I ran into this elderly white lady, and she started crying. And she said, I helped you at the Savannah Public Library. And I said, oh my gosh, it was really kind of emotional because I remember how scared I was. Uh, you, you, we, you had to cross in those days a lot of lines, but going to the library was worth doing then. Anyway, that's the library. I'd... Tell, tell me more about your, uh, about your Catholic education and your decision to go to seminary. You know, I look back, I used to ask Justice Scalia about that. He always thought it was interesting that we were so similar. He would say, Clarence, he said, my parents, my father was a romance literature professor, my mother was a teacher, so I know how I got here. How did you get here? <laughs> and why are we at the same place? Why do we have the same set of beliefs? And I think the beauty of having gone to parochial schools was they taught us how to, there was a right way to think about things that we had to be honest with ourselves, honest about math, honest about physics, honest about chemistry, that you couldn't cheat when you did your Latin translations, or German or French, because I had all those in high school. And there was, so I was talking recently with someone, he said it was your formation, that there was always a right way to do things, there was an honest way to do things. And the progression is, I became Catholic, and when I got, went to the second grade in 1955, Sister Mary Dolorosa, sister, um, and, and wonderful person. So at, at any rate, I became an altar boy, and the progression is you become an altar boy, and if you progress as an altar boy, you consider whether or not you have a vocation. And in those days, you went to a minor seminary. So in 1964, I decided that I thought I had a vocation. So I was 15, and, and then the following year, when I was 16, I went to the seminary. The difficulty was, again, things hadn't been desegregated yet. So you were, again, crossing these racial barriers, so you had that challenge. But the, to be honest with you, even that was not nearly as difficult as going to school in New England. Um, the, the, no one, there were a few jerks, uh, we all have those, but beyond that, the school was excellent, the people were fair to me, it was very, very challenging academically, uh, and also I got to, I like to say I finished in the top ten of my high school class, because there were only nine of us. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, hey, you have to take these things where you get them. <laughs> That would be the last time I'd be able to say that. <laughs> what about your decision to leave the seminary? Well, that was 1968. Any of us who were around in 1968, it was 1968. Uh, and the wheels were coming off the wagons in a lot of ways. And the little Catholic kid from the um, rather insular world of Savannah suddenly was reading and uh, it was a long, hot, uh, Dr. King was assassinated. The, we became quite race conscious, which has some problematic sides as, it, as good sides. And I think a lot of us, you went from being the nice Catholic kid to the angry black kid. And that was 1968. So then I returned home and was greeted with my grandfather, who told me that uh, if I'm going to do that, then I need to find out another place to live. So he kicked me out of the house, and I was on my own. I was 19 years old. 
That was you, May 1968. But you went to Holy Cross. I had, you know, I know there's all this myth about how I went. And people love to come up with narratives and myths. They should read the Aeneid or something. But at any rate, <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, I, my chemistry teacher asked a high school, a, a, a classmate of mine, to send me an application. I had ranked very high in my class in the seminary, first year of college, and I just simply filled it out and I transferred to Holy Cross. I was accepted almost immediately and transferred to Holy Cross in 1968. So I wasn't going to go because I was tired of being the only black kid uh, or one or two or three in the, I was going to go to Savannah State. <laughs> but then when my grandfather disinvited me from living in his house, <laughs> I, th I thought it might not be a good idea to hang around. So I just, um, the, I hadn't really thought about any other school, so I had been accepted to Holy Cross, so I got on the train and went to Holy Cross. You can see all the planning I did. <laughs> I mean, so that's why I say to people, my whole life has been providential, because I certainly didn't know what was going on. <laughs> in, in your book, uh, Justice, uh, you talk about uh, being a radical at, at Holy Cross, about being angry. Were you, did you feel you were being treated unfairly? At Holy Cross? Yeah. No, no, I was just mad at the world. I mean, it was 1968. I was just, I was angry. I mean, you didn't, I didn't, really didn't need a logical reason to be angry. I was angry about things that happened in the past. I was angry about things that were going to happen in the future. If you said good morning to me, I was angry. If you didn't say good morning, I was angry. So I was angry. And people sort of exploited that. And, you know, I was, I remember going to Harvard Square and in April of 19, April 15, 1970, and we were pretty upset. Uh, the, uh, the, you know, I, and I couldn't explain to myself why I did, just did that. All night we were rioting and I got back home got back to Holy Cross, and that's when I made a promise to God that I would never, that if he took anger out of my heart, I would never do that again. I would never let anger control my life. Uh, that was the morning of April 16, 1970, and I, I've attempted to live up to that. What made you choose law? Uh, it's kind of the Forrest Gump effect, you know? <laughs> what, how do I know? I was gonna be a priest. And when, you're gonna, when you have a vocation, um, you, look, you, you think the belief is God is calling you. And that's the only dream I've ever had was to be a priest. I don't, think, I don't think it ever quite leaves you. And when I went off to Holy Cross, I was in a little bit of a tailspin. So I was looking for the next call. What, was, what am I called to do? So I decided that God would call me to go to Savannah and to help out. And one way to do that was to be in law. And so I went to law school to return to Savannah. So if you notice, I've never really lived, worked in a law firm. I worked in a small firm in Savannah, Georgia in the summer of night, between second and third year law school because I wanted to return to Savannah. For reasons that I'm not going to get into, that job did not live up to my expectations. Now I've got a wife, my son's, today's my son's 45th birthday. So he was a little kid, and I had a wife and child and student loans, and now I need a job because I'm not going back to this situation that I don't think is right in Savannah. And I couldn't get a job in Savannah, Georgia. That's literally it. I couldn't get a job in Atlanta, Georgia. I couldn't get a job in Washington, D.C. I couldn't get a job in New York, and I couldn't get a job in L.A. I mean, I struck out every place I could. So I wound up in Jefferson City, Missouri. And because those people, because they didn't give me a job in Atlanta is the reason I wound up on the court. So it's their fault. <laughs> Otherwise, I would be comfortably a tax lawyer or something. <laughs> Tell me about your years at Yale. What about it? <laughs> Do you remember them? <laughs> Thanks for that. <laughs> You know, I think that had, that was ageism. No, 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 no. <laughs> that was, uh, that was, that was a slight on Yale. Oh, okay. That was all it was. 
Um, you can see I've always enjoyed my law clerks. Uh, the, and we enjoy teaching together. We have had, a, we've been teaching together for six or seven years at GW Law School, and we've had a total blast. Uh, the, it's a good thing they don't really pay us for it. The, uh, well, you're not gonna get paid now because you're gonna be adjunct like the rest of us. Um, you know, Yale was the perfect school for me. Uh, I've had my complaints for reasons after Yale, but Yale showed me where I needed to be. Um, I, if, I had, if I went back to Yale, I would go differently today. I wouldn't go with all these burdens of anger and bitterness and uh, self-restrictions and constraint. Um, I would spend a lot of time in the Sterling Library, which I loved being in. Uh, I would spend a lot of time doing the things that I like. I'd be like that young kid at, 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 at KU. I just want to go to school. I just want to be a kid. I like chamber music. I'd go to that. I like debates. I like recitals. You know, I'm reading um, a book now on the Plantagenets. You know, Kagan was at Yale. I should have gone to those lectures for, for um, you know, the, 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 whether it's Greek history or, or myth or wars, the Peloponnesian Wars or something. I, should have, I loved debates. I loved just the philosophy. And it was all there. I could go to off-Broadway plays. I didn't go to anything because I was mad at the world. So I was self-restricted in this place that offered all these opportunities. The law school was good for me because it showed me how much work I needed to do, to do what I wanted to do, how much I needed to learn, and, and whether and the question I asked myself when I left was, are you willing to do the work? Are you willing to dedicate yourself to learning all you need? And so I would have to say in retrospect, uh, it was small enough, um, it was academically uh, challenging, it was interesting. The professors were almost, to a person, fair to me. Um, it wasn't the best choice as far as being able to distinguish yourself because of the grading system. But uh, I, I can't say, I can't look back and, and offer any complaints. I know in the past I've not said pleasant things, but that had to do with some other reactions. Let's, uh, let's move forward to the confirmation process. About a third of your book has to do with the confirmation mm -hmm. process, and that's been 27 years or so. What, how is your view of com being confirmed and the politics involved? How has all that, how, has your view changed of it? You know, I think it's sort of like surgery. The only minor surgery is on the other guy. <laughs> the, um, I don't think these, the process is what it ought to be. I think that these are serious jobs, and I think they should be serious. I don't think they should become spectacle. This is not the Roman Colosseum. We're not gladiators. And I think we're going to lose some of our best people who choose not to go through the ordeal. They don't want to have to fight the lion in order to um, uh, be a judge or to be in government. And I think it's our own fault for allowing this to happen. Uh, I was confirmed ten to five times in 10 years, and it got increasingly worse. And I think that we are uh, going to, at some point, have the leadership we deserve, uh, because we allow the selection process to get out of our control and to have very little to do with uh, selecting the kind of people we need. If you look at you would think about it. You went through confirmation, and you, yours wasn't particularly controversial, but it was an ordeal. And um, what if it was embittered? Uh, I think that a lot of people have second thoughts. I can't tell you how many people I know who, in the middle of it, said, what was I thinking? And I think that's unfortunate. I think the country uh, is going to lose something because of that. So, I, you know, I don't have bitter feelings or anything like that. I don't have 
strong reactions, but I think I'm sober in my judgment of it, and I think a lot of the difficulties are irrelevant to the jobs. Think about it. how many people, for example, who have uh, done the job of judging, who actually talk about judges, is usually the people who are doing the most talking have never judged a single case. I just find it absolutely fascinating that some, a lot of the commentary has nothing to do with the job itself. I found, when I got to the DC circuit, I found that job absolutely fabulous. The people there were fabulous. And to the Supreme Court, after going through all those difficulties, the members of the court were just wonderful people to a person. It was a fab fabulous place to work. You were there. It was a lot of work. It was very difficult our first term. But in retrospect, it was an exciting time. Just the ideas and learning and everybody there made it as decent a place as it could possibly be. So the court itself is quite different from the ordeal. It's almost the opposite of the ordeal it took to get there. What are the, what are the best and worst things about being a Supreme Court Justice? Uh, the best, I think, would have to be interacting with my kids as a clerk to going through life, watching you all. It's just, that's the best part. Um, I, I'd have to say to my, my wife is, a, is now a former law clerk. She is emeritus. <laughs> the, we gave her an honorary law clerk degree. But watching her, my wife was 34 years old when I got to the court. Watching her enjoy the clerks and the kids, it is such a joy. I remember when Nicholas was born. Now what is he doing? He's in graduate school. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just so watching all of that. It's just fantastic. I remember when you and Janice got married. You know, just it's just that. So that's the best part. The worst part is the loss of anonymity. Uh, the I'm not. I don't like the public part, but that's a part of the deal. I'm not going to complain about it. But I just, those of you who are introverts, you know what I'm talking about. We prefer, and it's sort of like I said to my clerks who were introverts, introverts of the world unite. And then they said, but do we have to go to meetings? <laughs> <laughs> so I read this, I read um, Susan Cain's book, uh, quiet, which I think is the best book. Uh, the, um, for those of us who, who, who are introverts, it's, uh, that's the hard part, the public part. The, um, and you know what, I could add to that, and it's not a complaint. I just, this, all of this is a part of the deal. I have no complaints. The, um, I don't like the, the myth-making around the court and who we are. Uh, there's a real decided difference between what is said about what goes on in judging and the court and what actually happens. There's, there's the real world and there's the myth of that world. The, the, we don't have the time, the energy, or the ink, or the, uh, uh, the bits, or bites, or whatever they call that, to um, change to engage in that narrative battle. We have work to do. We have to write opinions. We, we um, judge. I've been around a lot of judges. Whether you agree with them or not, they actually put the work in. That's a, it's a wonderful world to work in. Um, where you actually have to write out your opinions and think things through and have arguments and go through all the statutes and go through all the constitutional provisions and go through all the rules of statutory uh, interpretation or construction, uh, all the interpretive uh, uh, canons. And, and it's just, it's fascinating. So I like that world. But then the world that people talk about it, that you don't agree on something. Oh, you hate old people. What? Or you're just, you, 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 you want to execute people. I haven't met a judge who wants to execute anybody. I haven't met that judge yet. In fact, every judge I have met 
the, when the, going through these, these cases, look at what it does to your hair. <laughs> so you start out, your hair is black, you have lots of it, then all of a sudden, you're follically impaired, and you're like, <laughs> your hair, what's left turns gray, and you said, oh my God, another execution. I mean, like, every one of us is like, did I get it right? Did I make a mistake? And, and yet, you have the people who create the myth about it. I've, uh, who think that suddenly you're callously doing these things. Those are people who've never stayed up in the middle of the night and voted for one of these things. So I, I, I like being around judges. Uh, I like the work, I like the world I, it, it, that it's, I'm a part of. The, I think the, 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 the world, those who talk about it are not doing the world justice or the rest of our fellow citizens justice in talking about an important part of their government. In talking about the work, um, I noticed in the Supreme Court statistics that for the last two years, you've, uh, you've written about twice as many opinions as of any of the other justices. That's because I really don't talk, so I get to write a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Why so many opinions? Who knows? So <laughs> Justice Scalia said I was solipsistic. So I said, I said, Nino, I have no idea what that means, but I like the ring of it. <laughs> so I think that means I really like my own opinions. But um, then he said once that, he said, Clarence, you really don't care for other people's opinions, do you? I said, no, I do care, but I prefer my own. <laughs> the, um, I don't know. The, um, I think it is really important that when you vote for these things, that you explain why. And that if it doesn't make sense, my, my granddaddy, I'm not gonna use the words he used exactly, but uh, he would say, boy, if it don't make no sense, it don't make no sense. Of course, he would spice it up a little bit. <laughs> and, you know, I, things have to make sense to me. When you come from the lower levels in society, when you, poverty, things have to make sense. My granddaddy, you have to feed, either you feed, fed the hogs or you didn't feed the hogs. You either greased the tractor or you didn't grease the tractor. You either planted the corn or you didn't plant the corn. It was binary. It was clear. And I think when we do these cases, we owe it to our fellow, fellow citizens to explain in, with, in, in plain language what we are doing. And sometimes when you see me writing, it's because what the court is doing, the premise I think disagree with, and I think it's wrong. And if you see, if you go back and you look at the Court of Appeals judges, I think it is a little bit glib, I'm not gonna say disrespectful for us, to when there are differences of opinions in the, in the, in the, in the courts of appeals and the district courts, for us not to explain why we hold a different opinion from them or not to fully explore the opinions below and just glibly uh, uh, disagree. And the, I think we owe them that respect. So I, I work through everything and I probably put a lot of pressure on my law clerks. I wouldn't clerk for me. <laughs> The, uh, that is way too much work. And I tell them that before they come. You sure you want to do this? Why are you doing this? Oh, boy, you know there's a 13th Amendment. So the... Um... <laughs> so. What's changed uh, in your judging over the 27 years? That is really a good question, judge. Um, I think there's... I, I, You know, it's sort of like if you climb a mountain, when you're at a thousand feet, you see something, you still look at the same scenery, but you have a different view from when you're at 10,000 feet or 5,000 feet, you see more. Um, I've been doing this so long that you see more, you understand more. Um, the reason I was reading this book on the Plantagenets was because of English common law, which started out, you know, people do a lot of talking about stare decisis, so I decided to teach a course on it to understand it in depth. But then to understand 
stare decisis, you have to understand English common law. To understand English common law, you have to understand where England came from, the Norman conquest, the Vikings, the, the Romans. Then to understand that, you've got to actually trace those histories. So anyway, I've done that. Now I'm fascinated by I'm King, the Plantagenets and what they've done in developing England. What were they doing? What does the exchequer mean? Why did the king pull all this together? But to understand, you've got to pull all the history together. But look how many years that takes. That's what I learned at Yale, that this wasn't a sprint. It was a marathon, and it was a lifelong endeavor. It's what you and I do when we teach constitutional law together. Look at all the cases we've read. Look at how much in depth we've read those cases. I mean, how many people who care about Trop v. Dulles? Right. You and I do. You and I care about it. Flas v. Cohen. Yeah, they cite it, but they don't read it. You and I do. We have to. Why? Because we're messing with other people's constitution. You and I have to do it, and you know why. We have to go back and read the briefs because we're tinkering with other people's constitution. We don't have any unlimited license to do that. And we certainly don't have a right to be reckless with it. So over the years, what you learn is it's like you've peeled, you've gone higher, or another metaphor would be you're peeling the onion. And you understand, you see more. Not because you're smarter or because people love to set themselves up as philosopher kings or something. No, it's because you've been doing it longer. This is what I do. I don't have hobbies. Well, except for rooting against Alabama. But yeah. <laughs> 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 oh, you knew it was coming, though, didn't you? Oh, my gosh, they stole another national championship. <laughs> Go away. The, uh, you know, I, the, uh, I don't, I do, this is what I do. I do law. And the, anybody who, you, it, become, it consumes you. The, um, and, I, and virtually everything I do is in preparation of doing this job. I think I owe this. Remember, it's about your calling. And if you're called to do it, you're called to do it a certain way. If you go back and look at Justice Scalia, look what he died doing. People forget. He had finished, he thought it was our job to fly the flag to go different places and to talk to people about what we do. He was more outgoing than I am, I'd, I'd be honest about that. But he'd tell me, Clarence, you gotta fly the flag. You have to go out there. Then the other thing, when he did his work, everything mattered to him. Every sentence, every word, every comma, every idea, it all mattered. And it mattered, that's one of the reasons he, we trusted each other, because we both knew it mattered. Getting it right was important to both of us. Why would we do it otherwise? Why would we be doing this? This is wrong. How would you look your fellow citizens in the eye if you didn't get it right? If I, if I looked at you and told you, oh, I don't care, I kind of, you know, I go and I watch cartoons, and then, you know, I kind of flip coins for your constitution, or I kind of just do whatever I want to do. I would never do that, ever, because that's wrong. And he believed the same thing. We took an oath to do it a certain way. So, yeah, I think I have to inform myself in order to make decisions about your constitution. And you feel the exact same way. And you, you just became a judge, and you know you feel exactly the same way, that you have a special obligation. Or you wouldn't have been 28 years as a reservist in the military, or the best teacher in, at GW Law School for a quarter of a century. Talk about uh, your teaching, Justice. What's, what the... <laughs> well, I knew you'd change the subject. Yeah. You taught it, you've been teaching at Georgia, at George Mason, Every, at he, GW. What's, I, what's, I love what's it. What's all the teaching? What is your goal in teaching? You know, I think that we, I think that people make learning, well, let me back up. You, did you see The Wizard of Oz? Yes. Okay, who was the wizard? Who was the wizard? 
I mean, I'm, I'm he was that little guy. He was a little guy. I could have yeah. said that. But. Yeah. So I think what we do sometimes is we make everything mysterious. Don't look behind the curtain. Yeah, we should look behind the curtain. That's what we do in our class. This, it's not mysterious. Look at the, there was a young man in our constitutional law class at the end. He said, I'll never look at law the same again. I don't know what his leanings were. I don't care what his ideology is. What we were trying to get him to do is demystify it. It's not that complicated. Why do we make it complicated? Why do we make it inaccessible? I had a buddy who was a quadriplegic. He was one of my best friends. And this is in the days back in the 70s before you had all these flushed curbs and curb cuts. So every time we got to like a curb, it was like the Great Wall of China. And we would have to, if we weren't there to lift him over, lift him downstairs and things, he was, it was inaccessible to him. And some, to some extent, that's what we do to law. We start talking about negative pregnance and dub, we use double entendres and throw in a little Latin and a little this. Why don't we talk in English? <laughs> you know, that farmer in rural Alabama has a right to know what his constitution says. And so what I do is, one of the things I say, and I said even when you were clerking, is that genius is not putting a $20, um, a, a 10 cent idea in a $20 sentence. Genius is putting a $20 uh, idea in a 10 cent sentence. It is to make it accessible as possible to average people. So when I used to go back home, the, think about it. I came from a world of illiteracy, or near illiteracy. And when you went back home, you could not talk down to people. That's what they would say to you. They wouldn't use the word condescend. That wasn't in their vocabulary. You're talking down to me. In other words, you're putting me down. But you had to explain things to them without treating them like they're lesser human beings. So you, it's what we used to say in the vernacular back in the 60s, you had to break it down. In other words, you had to speak you, without losing meaning, without losing content, you had to explain it in a language that they understood. And, and the, I think one of the things that we try to do in the opinions is to explain things to people. I think we owe it to people. In order to do that, we have to know it, as we do in the classes. Look at the eyes on the students when we're done. When they figure out that they know more about Lochner now than they did before, simply because we've read all the briefs and articles about it, et cetera, and we know the story behind it. And all of a sudden, they can claim it. They understand it. It makes sense. Or if you look, when I wrote separately in the McDonald opinion, what I was trying to do is, after all this talk of substantive due process, just simply explain to people, we don't know where it, where does it come from? Where does it come from? It's not in the Constitution. But, so you go back and you say, here's what's there. Now, you don't have to agree, but Privilege or Immunities Clause is actually there. Here's what they actually debated. Now, you can disagree with that, but you can see the coherence you can see, you can go back, go to, you can go to Dred Scott, and you can see that it was, you know, like Tawny is saying, blacks can't be citizens. Well, that's remedied in the 14th Amendment. And then it says you can't deny them privilege or immunities of citizenship. So it all makes sense once you go through the history. And I think that's what I tried to do in the opinions. It's not so much to give you some legal theory, but to give you the progress of, these, of this provision. And then to show you where it's connected to some of the other uh, concerns they had about blacks in the South being able to defend themselves. Justice, I wish we could stay all afternoon, but I've gotten to see Well, they're leaving, but you and I can yeah, stay. <laughs> I've, I've gotten a signal that the time is up, but uh, Thank you for your remarks. Well, thank you all for spending this, um, this afternoon with us. i uh, sorry to take so much of your time, but, uh, and maybe we didn't cover everything that you probably wanted us to, but we're going to be talking later on about the Dormant Commerce Clause for those who are interested. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you all very, very much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.